bucks like this with a bow, but firearm deer season in most northern states is comparatively short. Most bucks are taken on opening day, and to be successful, a hunter has to have an accurate firearm. A number of sporting arms companies make a variety of deer rifles at a variety of prices, and competition in the marketplace has been tough over the years. The Savage Arms Company, named after Arthur Savage, has been making guns since 1895, but in the 1980s ran into financial trouble. The new president, Ron Coburn, tells how they reorganized in 1989 to avoid bankruptcy. One week we went down to one product with five variations, so five total products. But we chose a product that we knew we could make, and if it couldn't stand the test and be profitable, we were going to go out of business. It was that simple. So it was a do or die. It was either going to stand alone in the market and be accepted and sell through and make us a profit, or we simply weren't meant to be in business because our name wasn't strong enough or our product wasn't competitive enough. But it did take that test. Colburn's overnight reorganization cut back Savage's employees from 300 to 100, and they made one gun and made it well. This gun, the Model 110 Bolt Action, starts as a 12-foot heavy industrial steel rod. For two days, I worked at the Savage factory in Westfield, Massachusetts, and made my own Model 110 from scratch. I first cut a 22-inch piece of rod for the barrel and a 9.5-inch piece, which will become the receiver. I carried these two pieces through all the processes so I could learn how a gun was made. Most of the first day, I spent on the receiver, going from machine to machine where I actually set it up and performed the operation. There are many machine shop terms they told me I was doing as I moved from station to station. Turning, centerless grinding, disc grinding, power milling, butt milling, drilling and tapping, fin file, shave and hob. These aren't things that I do from day to day. I was constantly splattered with oil and machine shop liquids, but it was a real experience to watch the changes to what began as a nine and a half inch steel rod and soon began looking like a rifle receiver. In fact, they gave me a rifle bolt to slip in at this stage. I was getting there, that bolt fit. Out of nine available calibers, I chose the 308 to make, a good all around big game caliber. So while these processes are done to all receivers, no matter what the caliber, the inside drilling of the barrel and chamber would be set up for the 308 cartridge. Now that last process there took off a big chunk of steel opening up the top of the receiver for loading and ejecting cartridges. At this stage we pick up the pace with a Kuraki, a computerized Japanese machine that can be programmed to do a number of operations automatically in sequence such as drilling and tapping different holes for scope mounts. After several more hours of machining with a number of other processes, my receiver is ready for induction heat treating. These coils are cold right now. I set my receiver inside, push a button, and within seconds, that cold steel becomes red hot. This is called induction hardening and has to be done on the receiver because it's a moving part that takes a lot of stress with constant loading and unloading. After a few minutes, the red hot steel is cooled down, the receiver is ready to take the punishment of racking thousands of rounds of cartridges. Now for the barrel, like I mentioned, this is a two day process I went through, reaming and swaging the barrel. Burnish reaming, rough turning, chamfering, grinding. A barrel might look like a simple thing, but it has to be machined to exact tolerances, down to thousandths of an inch. And it has to be done by skilled workers who fortunately were guiding me through each step. George Avery has an important job that, well, I never really did catch on to it. He looks through every barrel that comes down the line, and he can tell by the grooves if the barrel is straight. If it's the slightest bit off, he gives it a bend in exactly the right spot. Now, this is what he sees. Now, I can't tell if it's straight or not, but George can, and he makes sure every barrel is. He does this twice on every barrel at two different stages as the gun moves down the line. Now for the reaming of the bore for the 308 cartridge. Each of these steps has to be done carefully. Tolerances are exact for circumferences and head space. There can't be any scratches or aberrations in the chamber. And this step here with the cotton, well, this isn't done on every rifle, but since I did the machining myself, they wanted to double check the inside of the chamber. 
This is a fast drying polyester liquid that makes a casting of the chamber and the first inch or two of the rifling in the barrel. They wanted to, to make sure that when I withdrew the reamers and did the processes for the chamber that I didn't bump anything or make any scratches. If I did, it would show up on the casting. So this was the moment of truth. Ah, looks perfect. This barrel should be extraordinarily accurate. And now for the bluing. The process of bluing gun barrels and receivers is actually a controlled high-speed rusting process, which etches the barrels with hot chemical baths, turns them blue, and when you oil the gun, the oil soaks into the, the pits and pores caused by the bluing, and that protects your barrel from harmful rust. But bluing is actually a rusting process itself. I screw the barrel into the receiver, and now I have the main frame for my rifle built. From here, the assembly begins. Oh, yeah. It's looking good, like a gun. All these smaller parts are machined separately, the triggers, the firing pins, and each part has to be added to the barrel and the receiver. The quality of each of these parts is important because they're what fire the gun. When Savage reorganized, they upgraded the quality of all of these parts. All the guns that come off the line are set for a trigger pull of about four and a half pounds, and that's where mine was set just a little over four. And now for a stock. Now the stock doesn't really affect accuracy in a rifle, it just holds the barrel in the action so you can aim it. But I wanted a cool looking stock, so I picked the brown laminate. I don't have any gun stocks like this, and I like the looks which is part of the fun of owning a gun. Savage doesn't make a gun for looks, though, because that's what adds to the price. The Model 110 sells for between three and $400. It's highly accurate, but not fancy. As we near the end of the process, the gun is checked and test-fired. Technicians give each gun a thorough safety inspection, make sure the parts are all working as they should be. In the 1990s, a firearm manufacturer has to be extremely concerned with safety, what with the laws and lawsuits on product liability. Savage has a remarkable record with very few complaints. It's due to their careful manufacturing, their high-quality materials, and checking and double-checking each gun for flaws or weaknesses. The bolt here won't close on this slightly oversized cartridge, and it shouldn't. Now, now three cartridges are loaded in the magazine, the safety is checked. Make sure it won't fire until the safety is flipped off. Each gun is checked with a proof load as a stress test, and my gun is going to be put through a quick sighting in. The Savage Model 110 on bench tests has outshot some of the more expensive, prestigious rifles. Seiko's and Weatherby's cost more, but these working man savages hold smaller groups at greater distances as tested by several leading gun magazines. The gun I made really wasn't any better than the others that come off the line in Westfield, Massachusetts, but I like it. I like the way it looks, it's accurate, but you know, it won't cure one deer hunting problem. That's buck fever. You'll have to cure that one yourself. <laughs> Well, this is the gun. Doesn't it look cool? I mean, to me it does. I like this laminated stock. I like the, I always like that, that it's called a Monte Carlo stock on the end. It has a little notch out of it. Uh, it's something that, that I always enjoyed looking at when I saw guns because my guns were never, uh, the wood wasn't like this, wasn't shaped like this. And I know it doesn't really make a difference in the accuracy, but I enjoy it. Now, a scope, I did put a scope on this. Rifle scopes, very important when you get to be my age and up with your vision, because you have trouble focusing on the rear sight and the front sight. A scope makes a lot of difference, especially to older hunters, uh, in their accuracy. Guns are a lot of fun, and we like to maintain a lot of information about the shooting scope.